Now we dive into some ethical hacker notes with the session Cracking the Hacks, uh, Lessons from Attackers. Our speaker, Karen Elizari, is a security analyst. Karen is a security researcher, a distinguished public speaker, and an industry analyst. She's featured speaker at international events such as TED, RSA Conference, TED Med, TEDx, DLD, DEF CON, NATO, Wired, and many more. This session will cover tech tools and security, hacks to build a secure network, cyber threats, culling out the impingement of data, and the cure to it. Over to you, Karen. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Shreya. It's a pleasure to be with you all today at the NASCOM Technology and Leadership Forum. I'm Karen Alazari, as you heard, and today I want to share with you some important innovation lessons that we can all learn from hackers. Yes, that's right. I think we have so much that hackers can teach us about technology, about creativity, and about the future. And to talk about that future, I want to share with you something about my own past. Growing up right here in sunny Tel Aviv, Israel, I was a very curious young little girl. I asked my parents so many questions that instead of a bedtime story, I got volumes of the encyclopedia. When we first got access to the internet in the early 90s, I realized that through my computer, I could access all of the world's information, but I had to teach myself how the internet worked. So I reverse engineered web pages and I had to get past password protections on different websites and databases just to find the answers to my many questions. Sometimes those answers were on other people's computers. I was exploring and I was being curious and creative. I didn't realize my activities were called hacking. Not until I met my hacker mentor, Angelina Jolie. In 1995, she portrayed the fierce high school hacker called Acid Burn in a Hollywood movie all about the mid 90s hackers and their activities. That group of kids were like me. They were interested in the same things like I was. And for the first time, I saw people whose passion and curiosity for technology led them to become the heroes of the story. That's right, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie, those hackers were not the bad guys. They were the ones who actually caught where the real cyber criminal was hiding. So those hackers gave me a vision for the future that I have set my own journey to. I have dedicated my life ever since 1995 to the pursuit of the world of cybersecurity and everything that we can learn from hackers. These are just some of the organizations and the stops along the way. I spent time with the Israeli military working on security problems, and I've worked with big leading Fortune 500 companies and innovative Israeli security companies. I've also started two nonprofit organizations, besides Tel Aviv, which is Israel's largest friendly hacker community, and the Leading Cyber Ladies, which is a movement for women in cybersecurity all over the world. In 2014, I received an invitation to represent Israel at the international prestigious TED conference. I knew that was my moment to share my idea that hackers can help us. And so I shared the message that hackers can sometimes be the immune system of our international machine connected information age, the immune system for the internet. Today, I think we need to rely on that idea more than ever. Hackers show us what's possible. And even malicious hackers, even cyber criminals and attackers force us to evolve. So today I'd like to share with you some stories of what I like to call malicious innovation how incredibly innovative cyber criminals have become over the past two years and what lessons we can learn from their activities. And I wanna focus on stories in the world of ransomware, which is perhaps the most successful cyber criminal activity at the moment. I wanna talk about one ransomware called Ryak. It is a very scary piece of code and it actually takes its name and its image from a character from a Japanese animation series. Not just any character, Ryak is the god of death from the Death Note animation series. And in Ryak's own Death Note, 
the ransom notification that shows up on the computers that it infects and encrypts, it's got a very scary message. Ryak says that you should not try to recover the files, you should not restart or reboot your computer. Ryak scares people into action. It says no system is safe. And indeed, throughout the pandemic, in the height of COVID waves, Ryak went after hospitals, a chain of 400 hospitals across the United States. And in Europe, Ryak actually attacked a technology company. So it went after a company called Sopra Styria, which is a multi-billion euro technology development company, a company that even has their own cybersecurity department. When Ryak hits, it has very clever, very sophisticated ways to evade detection. In fact, in the last year, we've discovered that just like the COVID-19 virus, the coronavirus, Ryak evolves. And many of the ransomware viruses out there have variants, evolutions that allow the virus to spread more quickly, to infect more targets, and to evade detection. This is a report that the French authorities created on the Ryak ransomware variant they had to encounter. They identified that it has a worm-like capability, allowing it to move from machine to machine much faster, even spread between organizations. And it uses things like scheduled tasks and remote procedure calls. These are normative behaviors that you might expect to see in a regular operating system and networking environment. So it uses that to masquerade as legitimate internet traffic. And many of the innovations that are built into tools like Ryak are designed by the creators of these ransomware campaigns for one goal, reduce the time from the original intrusion until they get paid. Now let's talk about that original intrusion the classic infection vectors for ransomware like Ryak. Most people would know and maybe have experienced a ransomware that arrived first as an attachment in an email. And usually this is an attachment that would trick the victim to click on enable macros or to run part of the file. However, in recent years, ransomware operators have created more innovative ways to spread their ransomware, even going way beyond email. So now, now there's a very popular way, which includes using legitimate credentials. That means usernames and passwords for different organizations that have been leaked or hacked, or perhaps the criminals just guessed them. And with these credentials, they can log in remotely via different uh, SharePoints and remote collaboration tools to log in into the organization, spreading the malware from there. And the most sophisticated attackers actually go directly after those remote connections. And they actually find an exploit or an attack that they can utilize in the VPN, the routers, the firewalls, even in the security technologies themselves, also that they can go into the network. In fact, in this category, we see a very sophisticated type of attacker that specializes as becoming the initial access broker they create the first hack into an organization, and then they sell that access to other criminals down the line. Now, just to show you how innovative and creative criminals can be, in some of the ransomware emails, they have this document in their attack. Now, this is a document that pretends to have been created by the Windows 11 operating system, an operating system so new, very few people around the world have it on their computers. And what they're doing is actually hoping to trick the users to enable editing, enable content by claiming to be a product of an updated operating system. It's very ironic and very clever. But I don't just want to highlight Microsoft for their Office files or the Microsoft operating system. In fact, here is a very detailed table of all of the different technologies and computing and software environments that have been utilized by criminals to launch ransomware campaigns just in the last 18 months. And this was actually created by a helpful, friendly hacker called Pancake Lulz. So friendly hackers have cute names and they're out there helping us identify how these criminals operate. Now, many of you I'm sure have heard about the log4j vulnerability and the zero day exploit that was discovered just in the end of 2021. 
And when it was first discovered, everybody in the security industry was talking about how difficult it's going to be to identify where exactly in their technology stack they are exposed to this particular vulnerability. But it wasn't difficult for attackers. Within hours from that discovery, hours, there were already online tools that were automatically scanning and looking for products and servers and environments that they can take advantage of if they have that log4j vulnerability. So this is a screenshot from a scanning engine called Gray Noise. Gray Noise looks at internet traffic and it actually tries to identify scanning attempts by criminals. So you could say it's a scanner for scanning. And in this gray noise output, we can see that on December 10th, within hours, there were already many attempts to exploit the log4j vulnerability, many of them coming out of Tor exit nodes. So the traffic originates from the criminal's computer hiding using the Tor network or the, the dark net in order to masquerade their tracks. Attackers are moving incredibly fast these days, and as soon as there's a new capability, they take advantage of it. But they've also taken the opportunity throughout the pandemic to invest in their products and to come up with creative new business models. Some people have even called it a criminal renaissance. One of the reasons that we're seeing so many ransomware attacks and so many high ransomware fees and payment requests $5 million, $10 million, $50 million. This is because of an innovation, the double extortion model. In this model, the attacker doesn't just infect a computer or a network, encrypt the files, and requires a ransom in order to release the files. They also threaten that if they're not paid an additional sum of money, they will leak the files to the public or to journalists or even to that company's competitors. This is what happened to a company called CD Projekt Red, which is a multi-billion dollar company behind some very leading video games. When they were attacked, they, were the, they are the creators of games like Cyberpunk 2077 and the popular Witcher series. And the attackers knew this. They went after them on purpose. So this is the little note that the attackers left on their computer. And in the note, they say, hello, CD Projekt Red, we've attacked you, it's personal. And if you don't pay us, we're going to leak not just your internal communications, but even the unreleased source code to your latest products. So this is really the lifeblood of a company. This is the intellectual property, the source code of their games that they have been working on and developing for years. So this is the kinds of threats that allow attackers to get away with these high sums of money. The attacker behind this particular attack is a group calling itself Hello Kitty. So they've gone after a cute name with pop culture references, but they're not cute at all. In fact, they also launched an attack in South Africa, targeting the port of Cape Town. And their ransomware attack in that port actually stopped operations for several days. The logistics company of Africa, Transnet, couldn't move goods from ship to port, couldn't utilize their automated systems. So this is a group of attackers that might go for a cute reference, Hello Kitty, but they think globally. And for many of these attack groups, there are no more boundaries. It's not about any particular geolocation or any particular industry sector. They go after every target that they can attack. Now, another innovation I want to talk about is ROS, ransomware as a service. You're familiar with software as a service. Today, there are criminals that develop ransomware campaigns and sell access to their campaigns to their affiliates. So there's one group of criminals that builds the ransomware, builds the technology, and then they create a cloud infrastructure to allow their affiliates to distribute that malware, that ransomware, to their targets. And the original creators usually walk away with 20% of the proceeds. Here's one group that does ransomware as a service. They're called Lockbit 2.0. And they actually have a really strong emphasis on the development of their product. They continuously reinvest in making it faster. In fact, in their ransom notice, they even have a request for people to join their ranks. They are so bold as to recruit people to work with them from amongst their victims. 
Would you like to earn millions of dollars? Here's the address to collaborate with us. And they have endorsements, like our product is one of the best designed lockers on the market. And we have a focus on speed and encryption as well as functionality. Now, the people behind Lockbit even go as far as to give interviews. So there is a Russian language YouTube channel that specializes on interviews with cyber criminal groups. And they actually spoke to a representative of Lockbit that interviewed because they wanted to make sure their brand name is well known and they wanted to reach out to affiliates to recruit potential people to join into their criminal undertaking. When asked by the interviewer if they are looking for specific targets, they said that there, any target that can afford to pay the ransom is a valid target. And they're fast spreading in the Far East. They're going after targets in India, in China, and in Taiwan. And they are often affiliated or sometimes seen in collaboration with other ransomware brands like Ryuk and Egregor, which is another successful ransomware as a service product. So if we take a minute just to review some of the stories I just shared with you, there are some very crucial lessons that we can learn here about the way these criminals operate. For starters, they have a very fast development and deployment cycle. They invest back a lot of their proceeds into creating a new tool, a new technique, a new infection vector. And they push out new products weekly, if not daily. They come up with new business models like the ransomware as a service model and the double extortion model, and they recruit affiliates. Of course, they have very creative branding and PR. They think about their brand name. They think about how they are going to, perceive, to be perceived in the public. They have Twitter accounts and they give interviews. And they have innovative distribution models, including recruiting people to work with them from amongst their own victims. And to cap it all off, they have a global footprint. So all in all, if I was to talk about an innovative, fast-moving startup and describe these qualities, you would be very happy to invest your money in this sort of enterprise. And that's one of the reasons that these types of cyber criminals are so successful. There's even traditional crime that has now gone into investing in these types of initiatives because the barrier of entry is low. With ransomware as a service, the development and the technology element is just one part of a global criminal business. Now let's talk about our universe, our global footprint. Our own expanding digital universe is growing every day. In a few years, there will be more than 10 times digital devices more than human beings. There will be billions and billions of digital devices on our planet, but less than 10 billion human beings. And of course, the adoption of new connectivity, new technologies, new applications is fast moving. Every day, companies are pushing out new code, new products, and everybody is moving to the cloud. It's skyrocketing. So in this environment, from an attacker's point of view, from a hacker mindset, the attack surface has not just multiplied, it has grown exponentially especially with everyone getting so used to working remotely with digital collaboration tools like the one we're using today. So this has created a lot of opportunities for the hackers. I think that we have to learn from how hackers see this expanding digital world. We have to understand, we have to really take responsibility for the fact our household is not just about us and our family. It's also about the 10 digital devices that each of us is going to have. We're responsible for these devices. We are the chief security officer of our own home, even if we don't realize it. The hackers know that very well. Now, in the last two years, we all learned important lessons about maintaining hygiene, personal space, wearing masks, getting vaccinated for our benefit and others. Now we can talk about cyber hygiene and maybe adopting some of the same concepts into the digital world, keeping our devices safe for our benefit and for others, not recycling passwords, maintaining some digital separation between the different services that we use. It's almost like social distancing, if you think about it. At the end of the day, we all make hundreds of security decisions each day as developers and as consumers of technology. And it's very often in our industry to talk about the people uh, at the end as the weakest link in the security chain. 
I want to empower people to be the strongest link in the security chain, because I think many of us are on the front line of the cybersecurity battlefield. This is why we need that digital immune system more than ever before. Now, here comes some good news. In the last few years, a global ecosystem of friendly hackers has arisen from Nepal to Sao Paulo, from Tel Aviv to the United States, from Australia to Germany, all over the world. And I know many of them reside in India. These friendly hackers participate in bug bounty programs. They identify vulnerabilities or bugs, and they receive a bounty, a reward. In fact, in 2020, Bug Crowd, a leading bug bounty platform, found that there was a increase in the discovery of high risk vulnerabilities during the pandemic. And these are just some of the well-known brand names and big technology giants that have learned to cooperate and harness the power of these friendly hackers. And remember that Log4j vulnerability? Within days, companies were bombarded with discoveries and reports by all of the friendly hackers out there helping, doing their part to identify the exposure to that particular vulnerability. So nowadays, there are more ways than ever to be a hacker hero, just like I imagined when I was a young child. So for us as defenders, as consumers of technology, and as people who look to the future, should we keep calm and carry on? I think we take a page from the hacker's book. We adapt and we evolve because the future is in your hands alone. Thank you so much for your time and your attention today. You can always find me online as K3R3N3. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shriya. Please, everyone, stay safe. Namaste. Namaste, Karen, and thank you. The future is truly in our hands. Security, safety. That was quite an enlightening segment, and we are the chief security officers of our own home. Let's, let's always remember that. Many ransomware viruses have variants, evolution allowing virus to spread quickly, infects more targets, evades detection. So we need to be very wary and aware, and we're sure these hacks will provide and prove to be useful to many, many.